Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Trickle Church. To what? Trickle Church. Trickle Church. Yeah, we're, oh, everybody trickles in. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> hey, Becca. We're gonna preach out of Proverbs thirty-one today. <laughs> hey, do what? <laughs> you, you you see how it's working. All right, hey, I'm going to pray for us while we, while we uh, trickle in, and we'll jump into worship. Um, I don't think I have any preemptive things to announce. O- only thing I would say is um, it's the first Sunday of the month, so we're going to we do our Lord's Supper normally first Sunday of the month, and then also um, once a quarter we take an offering for benevolence, and that's this Sunday. Um, so you'll notice that there's um, some, uh, one of the offering plates is marked off as benevolence. And so if you want to give to our benevolence fund, um, feel free to, to drop in that plate. Or drop an offering in that plate. Don't drop yourself in that plate because that would be weird. Awesome. Let me pray for us. And then um, the shrimp shack shooters will lead us in worship this morning. Father, we love you so much. And thank you so much for this church and uh, the fellowship that we have here. Thank you for um, just what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. So, so grateful to have a place to call home, a place to feel at home, a place um, to be loved and accepted and encouraged and even even maybe mocked a little bit, but that's okay. Um uh, Thank you. Thank you for, for this family you've given us. I pray that we, man, that we would worship you as one this morning, that um, our love for each other would just be a delight to you, and um, that, that our hearts would be full of joy because we get to worship you together this morning. Man, I pray that you'd be with everybody who's going through a really hard time. Maybe the, 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 the word joy just doesn't seem like a reality or a possibility this morning. I pray that, that, that um, your Holy Spirit would comfort them. I pray that you would give them freedom to lament and uh, that, that, that even their laments, we know, would, will come to your ears as praise um, because to be angry at the evil of this world, even the evil in our own lives, is to be close to your heart. So, uh, yeah, wherever any of us are this morning, I pray that uh, our attention to you together would rise as a unified song of praise. We love you. We're yours. In Jesus' name, amen.
up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength we bow down and worship him now how great how awesome is he and together
Father, we love you, and um, we thank you for um, your love for us. And man, we just come to you right now in surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to summarize the gospel. Uh, but man, what's in my heart right now is that the summary is surrender. Like surrender. Do you, you know how you come to be saved by God is surrender. Right? I mean, you look at your life, you realize you're not God. You realize you need Christ and you surrender. And, and then, man, sometimes what we can do in church is, is then, then, then after we surrender to Jesus, then we come to church and then we think that after we surrender to get saved or whatever, that then we have to work really hard to earn a place with God, which is just wackadoodle. Or, or, or we, get, we get, feel like we have to, to work really hard to get a place before each other. You know, which is, again, whenever we're a group of people who said that we've got nothing if we don't have Jesus, and then we think we're, we need to impress each other or we need to toe the line for each other. It's just so silly. But day in, day out, we, we surrender. We surrender. Cease striving and know that I'm God. And uh, I don't know, man, letting go of the temptation to define ourselves and let ourselves be defined by God to receive grace. Well, guys, hey, we're here. The final sermon on the book of Romans. After today, we ran the race. After today, we can just leave Romans behind and never read it again. We're done. Ha ha. 18 months, Masamenos. That's how long we've been in, in Romans. And uh, 18 months. And, and I, I tell you guys, a lot of times I felt like I was going pretty fast. You know, I mean, we, we did pretty big chunks of text. And, and um, I, sometimes I was like, man, I may be going too fast through this stuff. Um, but we waited in the depths with Paul. And, 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 and I'm not going to rehearse the whole book today. We've, we've been rehearsing it for 18 months, you know, and, and, uh, uh, but, but it's been great. My, my, I think my favorite takeaway from the book of Romans is how I feel like I deepened in my understanding of grace and how to apply it to my life. And, and I felt like we did a lot of that together, which is really fun. So here's what I want to do today, because we're just going to go through the whole chapter 16. And, 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 and chapter 16 is kind of like Paul's kind of, he's kind of done. He's kind of done. He's shared his whole gospel. You know, he's, he's talked about the implications of that gospel in daily life. And, and now he's kind of like, hey, you know, tell, tell Frank I said hi. You know, tell all my homies in the, you know, 805. So, um, and then, then a, few, a few little last tidbits of, of things he really wants to make sure the church hears, you know, and so he just kind of these closing remarks, and so that's what I want to do with, with Romans, is, is, is I want to go through, and I, and I want to look at Paul's closing remarks, and I want to throw out some closing remarks um, based on Paul's closing remarks, and so the title of the sermon is Closing Remarks, but um, what I think we're going to see in Paul's closing remarks is, is that um, we see behind these words just some assumptions about what church is and how it works and, and, and even about the Bible. And so I just want to throw those things out for us to marinate on. And you, you pick one and take it home and marinate on it or, or pick one and, and, and meditate on it while we take communion together at the end of, the, at the end of service as we do this in remembrance of Christ. Um, but there's some fun stuff in these last words, and I'm excited about just going through them, and it's gonna, so it's, it's, today is going to kind of be like a uh, a shotgun message. I don't know if that's a good metaphor. 
you know, but it's but popcorn message. Oh, here's something. Oh, here's something. Oh, here's something. So that's kind of what it's going to be, okay? Are you with me or against me? Yes. Okay. Um, so let's, let's, let's jump in. Romans 16, verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sincrea. I don't know why it's pronounced Sincrea. In the Greek, it's Kinkreis. But everybody I looked at online pronounced it Sincrea. I don't know. Probably doesn't matter. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sincrea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. So right here, right off the bat, I want to talk about Phoebe. Okay? So this is the Phoebe of the Bible who wrote the song Smelly Cat. I don't know if you've heard. It's not true. <laughs> um, so F- Phoebe, she, she gets more words here in Romans chapter 16 than anybody else. And there's, it's for good reason. Um, and so I want to look at two points about um, Phoebe that we get in, in, in these first two, two verses of chapter 16. First, if she were a dude, the word servant would most certainly have been translated as deacon in more modern translations. It's the same word, diakonos, means servant. And in Titus, is it, yeah, Titus 3.12, when it's talking about how the, the, the role of a deacon in the church, it, it's the same word. She's a deaconess. And um, the description of her role at Sincrea, she was a patron of Paul and many others, worthy of reception of the saints to receive anything that she needs. The dudette was a deacon. Uh, she was a servant leader of the church on par with Stephen, a first martyr, martyr Philip, the evangelist. Um, Phoebe was a role model and leader in the church. Second, the placement of her name right here as Paul begins his closing remarks, remarks, and he says, I commend Phoebe to you. W- what's going on here is Phoebe is the minister who brought the letter of Romans to the church at Rome. I commend her to you. Receive her. Give her whatever she needs. She's awesome. She's been a patron to me and many others. She's a deacon in the church. Receive her. <clears throat> so, I mean, what that means is, the, the, you know, the way cultures worked back then is, is, is Paul didn't, didn't, didn't type out Romans on his MacBook Air press. I don't know, whatever they're called these days, on, on, on his iTablet. He, he, he didn't type out Romans, print out, you know, 80 copies, send it to the church at Rome, and everybody got their own little copy and went home and read it. You know, I mean, there's this document, this precious word to a church across the Mediterranean. You know, or I mean, it's, anyway, it doesn't, geography's hard. But, but it's a, and someone carries it to the church and, and, and says, hey, I'm sent here on behalf of Paul. Here's his message to you. And then the message is delivered. And if there's any points of, well, what does that mean when he said that? Do you know who clarifies? The messenger. It's it's like in Habakkuk when it says, when Habakkuk says, uh, write the vision down, make it clear on tablets so the one uh, one who reads it might run. The one who runs to read is the one who brings a message. I mean, God was telling Habakkuk, he wasn't telling Habakkuk to write the letter, scroll, pick. He says, hey, put the message down so it can be delivered. It can be proclaimed. And, and, and so Phoebe was the very first minister to preach the book of Romans. I want to read a little section from what... what was my favorite commentary to, to, to look at during this series on Rome's, Romans. Um, this guy named Richard Lungenicker. And uh, he, uh, he's got some great works out there if you want to read about. I think it's um, 
exegesis in the apostolic period or something like that. I think that was his. Anyway, really good stuff. But here, here's what he said. With respect to what part Phoebe had in delivering Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome, it seems evident that she carried the apostle's letter from Corinth to Rome, doing so at her own expense. As for what part she played in presenting and interpreting the contents of the letter to the Christians at Rome, it may legitimately be surmised that not only did she present Paul's letter to the Christian leaders and congregations of Rome, but she also served as their major source of information regarding the apostle's earlier use of the materials that he set out in the letter and his intentions for the use of such materials. After all, Phoebe had been Paul's patron during his ministry at Corinth and most likely heard from his own lips the contents of the letter as it was being formulated and must have had some part in discussing with Paul and other Christians of that area at least a few portions of the letter and therefore would have been in a position to explain to the Christians at Rome <coughs> what Paul was saying in the various sections of his letter, what he meant by what he proclaimed in each of those sections, and how he expected certain important sections of his letter to be worked out in practice in the particular situations at Rome. Probably Phoebe would, have, would be viewed as the first commentator to others on Paul's letter to Rome. And without a doubt, every commentator, teacher, or preacher on Romans would profit immensely from a transcript of Phoebe's explanations of what Paul wrote in this letter before actually having to write or speak on it themselves. So, um, yeah. The very first person to preach the book of Romans to the church of Jesus Christ was this female deacon, the patron of Paul, Phoebe. And so, um, just let that sit in. Let it marinate and affect the flavor of your taste for church. Verse 3. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Now, Prisca is a shortened form of the name Priscilla. So this is Priscilla and Aquila, who Paul met in Corinth after they were kicked out of Rome because of Emperor Claudius's edict that all the Jews had to leave Rome in like AD 46 or something like that, 49, somewhere around there. Um, and, and, and so it's really interesting that Priscilla's name always comes first. Priscilla is the female, and 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 and, and so, um, probably either she came from a higher social class than Aquila did, or she was just seen as more important for some reason. So maybe she came from a higher class, and so I don't know if Paul would follow those kinds of um, rules, you know, what well, he, he uh, higher social class, so he names her first. That just seems weird. Doesn't seem how, you know, Paul that there's. No Jew or Gentile, no male or female. Like there's, you know, we, we, anyway, I, with a congregation meeting at their house, it's very possible to put it in modern terms that Priscilla was just known as the pastor of that church. She was the shepherd. And Aquila, I don't know, he was, he was you know, the pastor's what, husband. Assistant pastor. I don't know. We don't know that for sure. But it sure looks like something like that's going on. <clears throat> yeah. Just just something interesting. You know, we're gonna start um, this year. Elders, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna meet this this week and, and we're gonna start working through the process of of, of um, appointing new elders at Grace. We're not kicking the old ones out. Um, but um, you know, uh, Ken and Lou both moved away, and so we're down to three. And uh, so it's time for us to start talking about getting new elders. And, and um, um, I believe, well, first of all, just so you know, the process of that is the, the, the elders appoint nominees, talk to them, make sure they want to do it, and then uh, uh, they go through a, a process, like a, a training process, Learning what an elder is and, and how Grace Church works and 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 uh, you know just just how to be an elder and then and then but those elders have to be uh, voted on and approved by the congregation and so um, that that's how that process works. But I just want you to know that that because of passages like this and 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 
um, our understanding of the Bible as a whole, that we, we do include women in that selection pool of elders at Grace Church. It's not very popular among Southern Baptist churches to do that, <laughs> um, but uh, we're not subject to the denomination's understanding. We're subject to, to God and His Word. And so we're not going to try to appoint women. Just We're going to try to appoint who God, we feel like God's leading us to, but that pool of people includes women. Just so you know. And if you want to have, we've got a great Bible study that we can work, if you want to work through like a little study, um, um, that's what the elders have went through. And I would love to share that with you. If you want to go through that, if you want to talk to me about that, I would love to talk to you about that. Not a hot topic, I don't think, for Grace Church. It is a pretty hot topic in Southern Baptist life these days. Just Google it and you'll walk away just refreshed with the love of Christ. Okay, um, let's go on. Verse 6. No, the second part of verse 5. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. So Andronicus and Junia, probably uh, a married couple like Priscilla and Aquila. Um, um, and, and, and maybe a couple who, who returned to Rome after being kicked out, just like Priscilla and Aquila. And, and Paul's telling the church to greet them. He's reminding the Roman church how important this Jewish couple had been, that they had suffered in prison with Paul. They were well known among the apostles. Your translation might read well, well known to the apostles, and that's fine. It's kind of more of an interpretive translation that's not necessary because among the apostles is, 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 is a better um, um, a better, more word-for-word tr- translation anyway, and leaves open, because it could mean either way. It could mean that they're well-known to the apostles. The apostles knew of them because they were awesome. It can also mean they were well-known among the apostles as in they were counted among the apostles, that they were considered apostles. And so there's a lot of, 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 of um, um, scholars who believe that that's what that means, that they were considered to be apostles, both Andronicus and Junia. But, but there's a good portion of those scholars who th- don't think that the word apostle was um, used always as a office, an office for the church. That, that, you know, because the word apostle means sent out. Apostolos. To send, it's, it's, it's the sent out one. And, and the 12 apostles were the ones that Jesus sent out, <laughs> right? So there's the 12 apostles and then, then, then there's many apostles. And so what it could mean is, that, is that, um, um, that they were traveling missionaries like Paul. And maybe they were busted and put in prison just like Paul was for, for that, that reason. Um, at any rate, this couple, both the man and the woman, were highly esteemed in the church. Listen, I'm not, I'm not, on, I'm not a he-man woman hater, and I'm not a feminist um, um, man hater. I... I, I and I'm not I'm not um, on a soapbox here, really. But I do think that this is there's some pretty um, evident, clear things here that's worth worth looking at and drawing out, right? So I don't want you to think that I'm I'm trying to make a big point here. That's just the, the blaring data from the first part of Romans 16. Popcorn sermons are weird for me. Are you okay? Yeah. More butter. I always liked kettle corn. All right, verse 8, verse 8. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, a great dog name, chosen in the Lord. Becca's favorite dog was named Rufus. My first dog, he, he attacked Becca. Becca didn't like him. He was a Jack Russell Terrier, and he was like, three inches too tall to be registered for like breeding. He was like just this alpha male as far as a Jack Russell can be. He was awesome. 
he left me. Um, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Also, his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas. Her- Anybody looking for names for kids or grandkids? Hermas and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Ner- Nerus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. And just look, like Paul has never visited the church in Rome. And he knows all these people from the church in Rome. I mean, can you just get a picture? How would Paul know so many people? And again, remember, it's not like they had a Facebook group. You know, it wasn't like hashtag the way. I mean, I mean, how, how did Paul get to me? There's just somehow in ancient first century, there's this network of people who are following Christ, who are so in love with Christ, who've been so transformed by the way they see everything that when they meet each other, they are family. And there's just this network. And Paul, he's, 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 he's working in, 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 in the, the Gentile community. You know, he's, he's, he's preaching the gospel and, 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 and he's just getting to know everybody and, and, and loving them. They're loving him. And so he, there's just this, this crazy network of, of believers, of, 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 of lovers and followers of Christ. And, 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 and Paul's like, hey, I want you to know all the churches, all the churches uh, in, uh, that, I, that I've been to, we talk about you. They want to greet you. Everybody's greeting us. There's just this unity in the church. I mean, they're screwed up. You know, that's why we have the book of Romans is because there were some issues in, in the, the church in Rome. Have you read First and Second Corinthians? There's some messed up stuff in there, you know? And, and people always, you know, say, well, we're going to be a first century church. Well, well, good luck with that. You need to repent, <laughs> you know? Um, but, but anyway, there was this, 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 this deep-seated love and unity in the early church. At least that's what Paul supposed should be. All the churches of Christ, we're all one family stretching around the world and throughout time. Wouldn't it be great if Christians lived like that? If, if everyone who who followed Christ, would treat each other the way that Christ would treat each other? Whether you go to this church or the church across the road or the church across town or the church across around the world, whether you're singing praise songs or hymns, whether your color of your carpet is red or blue, whether you're a hand raiser or an arm crosser, a, an up dresser right, or a down dresser, you worship on Saturday or Sunday. If you're following Christ, we should be one. I mean, I, I, I have seen churches competing over members. <laughs> what in the world is that about? What kind of organization are you a part of? Because it's not a church of Christ that Paul is is, 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 is expecting, right? We're one and we should abide as one family with one Father who is God over all and in all and through all. Verse 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. Listen, all that unity stuff is totally true. What that unity doesn't mean is that we erase any kind of boundaries 
or, or, or uh, definitions of who we are and who we're not so that we can be one. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, um, we should abide as one family with one father and God over all who is in all and through all, and that unity is worth preserving against the fluffy and fake approaches to religion and spirituality that try to pass as the way of Christ. It's also worth defending against the legalistic, duty-based, fear-based, shame-based religion that passes as Christianity sometimes. Seeking unity doesn't mean pretending like you don't think somebody's wrong when you think they're wrong. That's just called being fake. It's called lying. What unity means is If I think you're wrong about something, I can come to you and say, hey, I think you're wrong. And you can say, hey, I think I'm right and you're wrong. And we talk about it and we pray about it and we go to God's word about it. Maybe we get other insight about it. And then maybe we find out that we are both wrong about something and we grow in Christ together. Maybe we don't change our minds at all. But since what we're disagreeing about is what food we should eat or what day we should worship on or what kind of music we should play or whatever, that we can disagree and still love each other passionately as brothers and sisters in Christ. So being one in unity, seeking unity, does not mean avoiding tension. It does not mean not calling out wrong. And that's not an easy balance to strike. But you know what? Life is messy. And relationships are messy. And if if you want a perfect, if you find a perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it, right? (laughs) But if you want to join a mess of people, a messy group of people who are trying, training to love each other and love God, Grace Church is a great place. And if you can find a place like that, grab onto it. And embrace the mess. Verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Two things here, um, kind of in the same line of what we were just talking about, but the, the last little popcorn kernel. Um, first, let's not pretend like everyone is right as long as we are sincere. Because that's out there. Right? Have you ever experienced that? Like, don't don't judge my beliefs. All you got, if as long as you're sincere, it's okay. Well, you know, I can sincerely believe that Homer Simpson is God, and worship the Holy Mother Marge and the Son Bar. If I'm really sincere about that, that doesn't make it true, right? That makes me sincerely in need of 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 education or you know medication and I mean, you know, I mean, really. It's, but anyway. Um, 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 let's not pretend like everyone is right as long as we're sincere. There's truth and there are lies. There's the God of peace and there's the great enemy. And the God of peace will, will establish peace by crushing Satan under our feet. So here's how we pursue the crushing, by the way. Paul's already taught us about this. We pursue the crushing through genuine love that does not seek revenge, that does not return evil for evil, that overcomes evil with good. Through love, we overcome evil with good. We cast coals of fire on our enemy. How? By serving those who hate us and praying for them. Remember, if your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. If your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. That's how we crush the enemy. It's through Christ-like, sacrificial love. That's the first thing from this little passage. The second thing is this. We win. We win. This is, there's, there's, this is, this is not a nail-biter story. It's really hard. Jesus said in this, this world you will have tribulations. There, there's things in this world that God hates and we hate. And why God doesn't just snap his fingers and make everything perfect right now, I don't know. I do know that he plays by his own rules. He takes his own medicine because when he became a human, he played the human. 
with all the pain and all the hurt and all the sickness and all the betrayal and, 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 and messed up relationships in his life like we have in ours. Um, 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 but the end of the story is written. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Don't even worry if victory is in your future or not. If you have been saved by grace, you win. Man, that, sometimes that's the thing that gives us hope to get through the trashy times in life. It's the only hope that we have. Man, but for the cross, I don't know what I would do with life. That, 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 that there's victory but also that God loves me enough to do the cross. Because I got issues, Duh, but, but I have, I have uh, <laughs> mental issues. Um, and if, if, if I didn't have the hope of the cross, I, I, I would despair. I would despair. But you know what? The cross is real. God took on flesh and died our death so that we can have his life. Verse 21. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason. Weird name. And Sosipater, my kinsman. Hey, real quick, I want us to notice in this. Look, Paul never, Paul never did it alone, guys. He never did it alone. Everywhere Paul went, he, he was with somebody, with Barnabas and Mark and Titus and Silas, Epaphroditus, Demas, um, Timothy, Lucius, Jason, Sosipater. I mean, he was, he, Paul never went at it alone. He was traveling all over the world, but he always made sure he surrounded himself with believers. And, 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 and listen, everywhere he went, he was with believers. If, if he wasn't, he made some, Right? But he didn't just go, he didn't just go as anonymous Saul or anonymous Paul to a, a group of Christians. He had people around him who knew him, who'd seen him lose his temper, who knew what he was struggling with. He, he was doing life in community, even as a traveling missionary. And it's so important that we don't forget that. Extrovert or introvert, you were not created to do this life alone. Um, also, notice that Paul never did one-on-one -on -one discipleship. I don't know if you were raised in a church where you gotta you gotta have have someone you're discipling and you need to be discipling someone you're discipling and you need to be discipled by somebody. And there's this one-on-one -on -one like, and it was called I've heard it's called the Paul Timothy model. But the Paul Timothy model doesn't exist in the New Testament. It's the Paul, Timothy, Titus, Epaphroditus, Silas, Demas, Mark. It was Jesus didn't disciple one on one. He had a whole band of people going around, a mixture of and, and, and apparently with Paul, with with Phoebe and Junia and, and and all the other women that he listed in, in, in his greetings, it was it was a community of men and women being discipled together. Um um. Yeah, discipleship happened in intimate community, both men and women together. More than a cup of coffee once a week, more than a worship service once a week, discipleship happens in small pockets of intimacy, doing life together with Christ. Just saying. Verse 22. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, Greet you in the Lord. Anybody see a problem there? Anybody? Huh? Paul wrote it. What's going on? The whole time we've been reading, I've been preaching, like, look what Paul said here. Look what Paul said here. Look what Paul said here. And then we get here to verse 22 of chapter 16, and Tertius comes up and goes, hey, hi, it's me, the one who wrote the letter. Yeah. Wrote down, yeah. I, I don't know the the, the Greek, um, but it's a, that's a good interpretive translation, you know. I'm sure. Um, um, but here here's the deal, man. 
maybe your churchianity was not like my churchianity. And, and my churchianity might have been my own problem, what I was caught, not necessarily what I was taught. But I grew up thinking that the Bible was written by individuals who were like inspired by God. Basically, it had an idea of almost, almost being like possessed by the Holy Spirit. And I sat down and there's like, and even though there's no like sun in the room, there's like a beam of light coming down from the ceiling, you know, and they're like, the word of the Lord. But what we see here is something more like Paul, probably just talking the letter out to Tertius. Maybe all these guys, Timothy and, 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 and Titus and, and Phoebe and, and whoever else, you know, was listed, they're all in the rooms. And like, Ooh, that's really good. And, and then Jason pipes up and says, you know what I was really thinking? I was talking to the, these prisoners and I was, uh, but, but, but you know, but uh, guys, the, the, the Bible was not written by a bunch of powerful, holy men. To, 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 to like have religious authority over the church. The Bible is a work of the community of God. It is holy and true and good. It's the collaboration of God's people, men and women, rich and poor, apostles and dudes named Tertius, influenced and carried along by women and men in community, always affirmed and preserved by the community of faith who had received the word from those who had gone before them, from the apostles who received the word from Jesus himself. I think some of this stuff is, is, is most evident and interesting as you look at the Old Testament getting further and further away from the Western mindset that began in the Greek mind and influenced us. And now we, 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 just, we just expect the Bible to be written down in red behind closed doors. We don't, we don't wrap our mind around the fact that the early church was an oral community. The vast number of believers, Jew and Gentile, when they experienced the Scriptures, they only experienced them through their ears. And it was carried along from one performance to the next. But you know that every single person who grew up in that Jewish community knew the story of the Exodus. They enacted the Exodus every Passover meal. I mean, they had been hearing these stories since before they were born. They heard them in the, in the womb, man. They internalized it. It was who they were. It wasn't just data that they were taught in church. It was a reminder of who they actually were. The inspired word of God, man, it was always being written down on the heart, on the hearts of God's people and held in trust. And that's how it's to be for us. We don't study the Bible like we study a, a, a science textbook so we can get data out of it and, and apply it to our lives. Guys, we are being reminded of who we are. And we take that identity and live it out together. This is our tribal identity, guys. That's all we have time for on that topic. But isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful to think of a God who is relationship, not preserving a holy text on stone or paper or papyrus, but a God who is relationship, who is love, preserves his word in his people. Verse 23, Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greet you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and, a, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. And that, guys, is the book of Romans. 
We're going to take communion now. And remember, whenever Jesus held the Last Supper and, and gave communion, he said, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And, and remembering Jesus, you know, I came from Texas, and, and I apologize. Uh, just kidding. I apologize that you guys weren't worthy enough to be born in Texas. But um, um, there's a saying in Texas, and it goes like this, remember the Alamo. Now, when someone in Texas, especially back in the day, when they said, remember the Alamo, do you know what they didn't mean? They didn't mean, hey, remember that there's this building over in San Antonio, Texas. It's built like this. It's a mission. Remember that. That's not what they meant. Right? What do they, what do they say? When they said, remember the Alamo, what do they mean? Man, it, I mean, it's kind of hard to even put into words, isn't it? Remember the Alamo, remember the sacrifice of our fellow brothers and sisters who are on the same page with us on this purpose, this, 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 this purpose, you know, and, 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 and remember what is true and what we're fighting for. Remember who we are. Be propelled forward through that mighty event. Like, remember the Alamo. When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It does not mean that we have this little, you know, calculator in our mind. Like, oh, I remember who Jesus was. He did this and he did that. He did that. Check. Remembered. It. Man, remember, remember the Passover, the Passover lamb. As, as, as the blood of the lamb covered God's people from death so that God could rescue them out of slavery and take them across the sea to the promised land. Remember that Jesus has led the great exodus, parted the sea of death to carry us to the other side because he's the Passover lamb whose blood has covered us that he might set us free from the slavery of this world. Remember Christ. And I don't, I don't know if any, any of this stuff that we went over today, if, if any of it hits you heavy or, or, or hard, but, but maybe that's the thing that you can latch on to and remember to, to meditate on as we take communion this morning as the church of Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us and the elders will come forward and, and we'll pass out the bread first and I'll, I'll read from uh, uh, the Bible, and we'll take the bread together, and then um, we'll pass out the, the, the juice, and I'll read from the Bible, we'll take the juice together. <clears throat> um, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Grace Church, we believe that communion is for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. And so if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're on the fence, if you're, if you're thinking about this, feel free to not partake. You won't hurt our feelings. Nobody's looking around. Everybody's focusing on their relationship with Jesus right now, and so it's a safe place. Um, 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 we don't have a jesus So if you're not a follower of Jesus and you take it anyway, God loves you. There's no sin in that. <laughs> you're good, okay? Um, but let me say this. If you weren't sure if you wanted to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that you've been having a tugging on your heart, maybe to this morning, even though we had a, a popcorn message through Romans 16, maybe you're hearing from God right now and you're believing in your heart that, that God raised Jesus from the dead for the forgiveness of your sins. And you want to you confess with your mouth to him that I, you're not Lord, you're not God, he is. And you want to become a follower of Jesus. There's, I can't think of a much cooler way to start that journey than to take communion, to say, I am going to partake of Jesus with his community dine at the table. So feel free to take communion this morning as your commitment to follow Jesus. Amen? Let me pray. Oh, God, we love you so much. You're, 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 you're crazy, God. It, it's, 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 it's crazy um, how you love us. It's crazy how you use us. Gathered in this room is Ziklag, a bunch of goobers, with all kinds of issues, um, um, man, we're un- we're unsteady. 
We can be unfaithful. We can be uh, uh, just, just silly. But we are not held together by our faithfulness, but by yours. And it's your grace that leads us to repentance, to obedience. And so, yeah, we just, we just worship you. We thank you for what you are making us into. Thank you for taking us out of the lives of the world and writing your word on our hearts, reminding us of who you created us to be and making a way for us to walk in it. You're great. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, growing up, you know, Jesus said, "Do this in remembrance of me," right? And growing up, man, and I, I don't, I don't think that <laughs> I just, I'm not going to qualify myself. Growing up, I usually heard a sermon before taking Lord's su- supper, and usually out of First Corinthians 11, that would talk about how people in Corinth were doing the Lord's supper wrong, and that's why some of them were sick and some of them were dying. If anyone eats or drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And, and, and so th- the message was this. Take a long, hard look at your life right now. And make sure there's no secret sin in your life. And looking back on that, I'm like, wouldn't I know if there's a secret sin? <laughs> like, it takes a, have you ever covered up sin? It takes a lot of work. You don't have to look long and hard to find out if you have secret sin. Right? It was so fear based and, and 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 I mean Corinth was messed up. They were having they were turning the Lord's Supper into a party time where the rich people would, 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 would get drunk and then have all this food and then and then the, the poor people would come in later and, and not get anything and leave hungry. It sounds like they were having like a real meal. And Paul's like, Hey man, that is trash. That is nothing like what Jesus is doing. You are profaning the body and blood of Jesus by treating it that way. Like, that's a great message to that, to that situation. You know, but Jesus, when he hung on the cross, didn't say, look what you did. 
He hung on the cross and said, it's finished. While they were nailing him, he said, my father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Like Jesus didn't hang on the cross as a sign to give us a, a guilt trip, but to set us free from shame. Do this in remembrance of me. We, guys, we, we don't have to remember Jesus isn't sitting down and like, oh, please, I hope I'm not sitting too much. And Oh, that's missing the whole point of the cross. Do this in remembrance of me. Man, the body has set us free from shame and death and fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Man, let's do this in remembrance of Christ. What a celebration. You know the word companion it means uh, bread together. Pan is bread. Com is together. Bread together. Companion is eating together has always been a communal thing. I mean, we are, we are partaking of the body of Christ together. This is a beautiful symbol of who we are, bound together in our love of Christ and his work on the cross. Paul wrote and said, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we love you so much. And uh, man, thank you for um, the great gift. And um, for those of us who spent a good portion of our lives being afraid of taking advantage of it or taking it for granted, would you give us the freedom today to take advantage of it? (laughs) To take it for granted because it was granted to us that we would um, abide in your grace in the absolute freedom because the Son has set us free, so we're free indeed. Let us experience more of the fullness, of the freedom, of the acceptance, of the love that you gave us through the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
there's a, a great story in uh, 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18. And uh, you've probably heard the story before, maybe, if, if you went to church and Sunday school or whatever. But it's where Elijah has the showdown with the prophets of Baal. And there's all these prophets, like all these prophets of Baal, and, and they go on Mount Carmel. And, and, uh, uh, and, and, and essentially, you know, Elijah's like, hey, you pray to your, your God, I'll pray to mine. And who, whoever is God lights the, the, off, the, the altar on fire, that's the real God, right? And so the prophets of Baal... They all start chanting to Bill, and it's really funny. Um, they say, "Oh, Bill, answer us!" And and they're uh, fr- from morning until noon, they're yelling this, and um, there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar they had made, and at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, "Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself." I mean, he he was really he's like, he's like maybe he's going potty. Yell louder. I mean, it's really what he said. It's really, it's really funny. Um, um, or maybe he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. As midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice no one answered. No one paid attention. Man, humanity has had this idea that God is violent and wants violence from us. And we cut each other and we cut ourselves and we bleed out trying to get God to accept us. And God stepped onto the cross and said, no, Amen. no more. Your blood is not required as a matter of fact, have mine. It is a weird thing that Christians do when we say we are partaking of the blood of Jesus. We're drinking his blood. Guys, it's not weird. To, if you've been raised in the church, it's not weird to you. Uh, talk to an unbeliever. It's weird. But what we're doing here is we're saying we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is nothing you could do to earn his grace. There's nothing you have to do. You are covered by his blood. We are not the prophets of Baal. We don't have to cut ourselves. That is no longer our custom. Our blood is not required of us. We are partakers of the blood of Christ that cleanses us and washes us as white as snow. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As often as we are partakers of the body and blood of Christ, we proclaim that we are covered and free and whole because of the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ until he comes and establishes that kingdom forever. Let me pray for us, and the band's going to come up and lead us in a couple of songs. Um, This is your time to um, respond to God, so respond um, um, however he leads you. Um, I, I, w- I want to give one, uh, just in case anybody needs to leave early, I want to give one announcement. I know it's a weird time for it, but man, I just, I, I've, I've come to believe that Jesus wants us to have shalom, wholeness. We, we don't just have a golden ticket for heaven until we die. That's not what we just celebrated together that we can walk in the kingdom and, and the, the healing and the wholeness now. And, 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 and I believe that there are some things that we need to learn and practice so that we walk in, can walk in wholeness. And so we're, we're, doing a, we're starting a, a relationship series. It's going to be a sermon series starting next Sunday. But along with that, um, the Wednesday after um, Valentine's Day, I think it's the 16th, um, Dr. Sarah Kappen is going to come and lead us in um, kind of a seminar on relationships. That focus is going to be on marriages. But listen, whether you're married or divorced, going to be married, never going to be married, know somebody who's married, have ever heard of the word marriage, 
there are things that you can walk away from in this, even those Wednesdays that are focusing on marriage, because, man, how, if you're, a big focus of all this is going to be, how do you relate with yourself? And, 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 and because if you don't, yeah, because if you're not relating with yourself well, you are not going to relate with others well. And, 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 and guys, I believe that that is biblical. I mean, Galatians 6 says things like, go help your brother, but keep an eye on yourself, lest you too be tempted. In all this relationship that we have, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Like, we're, we're, how we see God needs to change how we see ourselves. And so we change how we relate with ourselves, which then change how we relate with others. And guys, that's wholeness. That's shalom, is being in right relationship with God and yourself and others and stuff. That's shalom. And I, and I, and I, and I am passionate, <laughs> passionately convinced that the stuff that we're going to be discussing during this series, both on the Sunday mornings, on the Wednesday nights, and then um, on March 1st and 2nd, that's a Tuesday night and a Wednesday night, Dr. Hub McWilliams is going to come and talk about emotional, um, uh, 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 emotional intelligence. March 1st and 2nd. And, and so really encourage you to, 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 to be involved with that as much as you can, wherever you are in relationships, because um, it'll definitely help your relationship with yourself, which is your relationship with everybody. Now I'm just repeating myself. I'm like we're in the school of redundancy school. Um, okay, I'm going to pray for us one more time and let the band uh, carry us to the throne as, as you respond to God uh, with whatever he's, he's shared with you this morning. All right, let's pray. God, we love you. Uh, I'm so grateful for your work in, in my life, for your work in the lives of this congregation and how we can build each other up into you. I'm so, so, so thankful for your grace. I'm so glad <laughs> that my definition of me is not defined by me, but by you. Teach us to, to walk ever more uh, tightly, closely, uh, within your definition of us, for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. We'd um, like to invite you to, um, through these couple of songs that we're going to sing in response to um, today, to what God is doing here at Grace and what God is ministering, how God is ministering his love to you individually, to your heart. Uh, I want to say, Nick, thank you for leading us in communion. That was probably one of the most powerful um, forms of communion that really touched my heart and ministered deeply the, the grace and the love of the finished work I think it really comprises a lot of um, the book of Romans also. You know, it was a wonderful way to end this study. And, and thank you for um, helping us understand. Um, I really appreciate the uh, example that you shared with Elijah. And it reminded me, you know, fast forwarding a few hundred years and some of the things that, you know, as we've been talking about Paul and his ministry to the church, it ministers to us here now, our church. Mm -hmm. And what it reminded me of as you were sharing is in the book of Galatians, I believe it's in chapter 3, where Paul, he's, he's trying to help them understand this finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. And, oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Have you started off in the spirit and now you're trying to be perfected in the flesh? Right. And it's that same, that same, um, <coughs> filter right. that has been handed down to us and we've adopted and, and, and sometimes it has control over our lives and it blinds us from seeing mm -hmm. the power of God's love. Yes, Lord. Not the word. I'm, I, I think what I'm wanting to, to focus on as we, as we sing these songs together mm -hmm. is we really allow the truth of the finished work of Christ to minister to us without our participation 
in, in, in that all we do is receive you with an open heart, Amen. with open hands, and experience the reality of the power of thy blood, Jesus. Amen. The reality of the power of his mercies new every morning. Yes. The reality of the power of his grace that comes from the reality of his finished work on the cross of 2,000 years ago. Amen. So I invite you as we sing these songs, I, I love this song <coughs> that we're going to sing here, because for me, as I've said before, like, uh, Lord, I lift your name on high. It's the whole gospel. <laughs> and I love these songs that we have that are the yeah. full gospel. Mm -hmm. And allow this song to minister to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to wash and cleanse you, especially as we've experienced uh, mm -hmm. this study in the book of Romans. Mm -hmm. And I believe we're going to John next. Love John. Mm -hmm. The the mm -hmm. book of John for me is 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 uh, the truths that lie in it. I, and I am I was sharing with Karen. I am so excited about what God is going to do, what God is doing mm -hmm. here at Grace Church, mm -hmm. and through the studies as the Holy yes. Spirit leads Nick, and He helps us understand. The book of John for me is foundational to my faith. The Amen. truths that lie in there are so deep and so heavy. Mm -hmm. So wet your appetite. Let, let's <laughs> allow this, this season of Romans to, to um, put some period and some things in our lives and open up some new chapters for us. And allow you know, these songs that we sing mm -hmm. and the declaration of what these songs are mm -hmm. to be the finished work of Christ for you mm -hmm. in this life. Yes, Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loved the world hey amen hey take a second just look around look around you um, what you're looking at is the greatest gift God's given you besides Jesus Christ. Amen. But in what you just saw is how you experience Christ in flesh today. Each, I'm talking about each other. You, you, you didn't, okay, you didn't, I didn't know. You know, some metaphors, you know, so. Um, Quick announcements, guys. Um, don't forget to keep um, worshiping God with your tithes and offerings. We raised $484 for um, Lottie Moon World Missions, so that will all go directly to um, uh, missionaries around the world. Um, what we try to do, I don't know if you've noticed, but we, what we try to do is have like a uh, mission, mission focus every month. And so with Lottie Moon, we had two months of, of Lottie Moon offerings, and our, our focus for February is... Um, uh, the uh, Tender Life Maternity Home. And so they, we have these little bottles and we fill them up with uh, uh, coins or cash, whatever, and then bring them back and we send them to Tender Life. And um, they, they, well, Tender Life is a faith-based program committed to providing homeless pregnant women with a safe pregnancy and healthy alternatives to abuse, poverty, and addiction. Uh, women receive the education and life skills training that are necessary for a single mother to successfully provide for her child. And so, you know, guys, life matters, and it matters from womb to tomb. And uh, sometimes the church defends the womb a lot without uh, everything that goes from there to the tomb. And uh, I, I love th th this ministry, um, loves on, on, on kids, and provides for their entire life by providing for, for moms to be able to care for their, their kids. So... Um, grab a bottle on your way out, take it home, fill it up with money, and bring it back. And you can take more than one bottle if you want. You know, just just keep bringing them back. Um, don't forget the welcome cards in the, the the seats. If you have any prayer requests, if you want us to reach out to you, um, anything like that, you can fill fill that little card out and drop it in the offering plate. Also, remember that we're doing a benevolence offering this morning, and so if you want to give to our benevolence fund, if in case anybody, and we uh, you know we we often use that for um, fellow gracers. Who, who get hit on hard times and need some help. Um, and so we have a fund that we can give, give money for, for benevolence needs. So um, if you want to give to benevolence, the offering plate labeled benevolence will go to benevolence, and the other offerings will go to our, our no normal offerings. Um, just, just, I know this is businessy, but just, just for transparency, I want you guys to know we, we voted and approved our 22 budget um, at the end of last year. We made a change. I just want you guys to know we made a change to that budget because we got actual numbers from our insurance company. So our, our, our insurance um, budget line item went from $9,500 to $11,040 um, to cover the difference between what we budget. And it's just insurance is going up like everything else. But, of course, insurance, you know, once the Thomas fire hit and then the other fires, um, everything is just skyrocketing as, as far as uh, insurance goes. Um, um, all right, don't forget that Mondays, Celebrate Recovery, man, a great place to surround yourself in groups of intimacy to grow in Christ together. Um, so Mondays at 6.30 in here, um, this Celebrate Recovery is not just recovery for drugs and alcohol. Um, it's for a myriad of issues because we all have a myriad of issues in our life. Um, Wednesdays, Wednesdays um, at 6.30, um, the youth group meets across the street in the auditorium of the old Washington School. And um, Thursdays at 6.30, a small group Bible study at the Bays House. And you can talk to the Bays or me if you want more information about that small group study. Again, a great way to surround yourself by people who love you and will, are willing to do life with you and for you to do life with. Right. Um, today for church, we'll have Munch and Meditate talking over Dr. Hud McWilliams' book. You don't have to have the book or have read the book to join uh, the study. It's just a great way to talk about wholeness and, and, and emotional, mental health. And so um, those two right there 
are leading this, mostly Lee, I think. She, she's the boss. And so uh, y'all can talk with them if you want to join in that conversation. And then uh, next Sunday, besides the, the big news is that we're starting the relationship series. That's by far the biggest thing. Also, there's um, some um, sporting event. Some people are some some. some we're gonna watch some. We we'll watch grown men throw a little ball around and dress weird, and somehow that's okay. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> oh we're having we're having a, a, a Super Bowl party. The celebrate recoveries of. Uh, uh, Encounter Church and our church are, are throwing it together and calling it a sober bowl party. And so we're going to have lots of food next door in the fellowship hall. We're going to hook the game up on the big screens in here. And so we'll be bouncing back and forth and, and, and getting food and eating and watching the game in here. It's going to be lots of fun. So that's, uh, I think that's going to start at 1 and kick off at 3.30. Oh, and it's, it's a potluck, so bring your favorite dish. Okay, and if you want uh, information, um, you can call Buddy. Or Mike, and I'll get you those numbers if you don't. Um, okay? That's it. That's all the announcements. That was short, right? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Becca wants to talk about something. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Becca. Um, yeah, thank you, guys. It was it was it was crazy. So, all right, I guess we're getting hungry. Probably should go see if we can still beat the Methodists to the restaurants. Um, let me read our uh, our uh, blessing from Ephesians chapter three, and we'll be dismissed. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit towards your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>